Good evening. Good evening to everyone. Um, normally, this is done on Saturday. This is done on Friday afternoon. This is the 18th of the Dr. Obatashaka shows. And this is going to be an interview and conversation with Professor Dr. Baba Zak Kondo on his book, Conspiracy Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X. And um, I wanted to have Brother Kondo on because he is the foremost authority on Malcolm, and you're going to get the best stuff, particularly on Malcolm's assassination. He's the foremost authority on it. And um, I think you're going to benefit from uh, this discussion. Um, I met uh, Dr. Professor Baba Zak Kondo um, as he was working on his book. And I had the pleasure to um, read a draft of his book. And um, I, I saw that this was an outstanding uh, piece of work and a uh, great deal of research, but a work is only as good as the consciousness of the writer, as well as the work that they do in terms of research. So, Brother Zach, it's a pleasure to have you. How are you the doing? Pleasure, uh, the pleasure is uh, mine, Baba. Also, uh, when I was uh, doing my research, you know, the, the uh, your book on the, um, you know, political legacy of Malcolm, was important to my work as far as putting, you know, information in context. I don't know if we've ever, I've ever had a chance to say that to you, but I did want to say that to you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, well, thank you and thank you because uh, yours is a monumental work. In fact, scholars in the field acknowledge that uh, Baba Zak Kondo's work on the assassination of Malcolm X is the best work and people who have done research in the field acknowledge that and have written, um, including uh, the author of uh, The Judas Factor, which is itself a good work, he acknowledges that yours is premier. Uh, could you give people a little background on yourself? Oh, sure. Um, I'm uh, from Virginia. Um, uh, went through the public schools of Newport News, Virginia. Anybody familiar with Newport News? It's uh, on the peninsula. Uh, it's a peninsula near like Williamsburg. Most people know Williamsburg. It's between Williamsburg and Norfolk, you know, just to give you a general idea. Um, when I was in the seventh grade, we were bused and um, we were, uh, I came from an all African neighborhood. We were bused to, a, to an all white school. And that was the year that uh, I found the autobiography of Malcolm X and I read it. So I was 12 years old, I was in the seventh grade and it basically changed my life. Um, you know, I've talked about this a lot, but uh, I was one of those young brothers who generally, you know, when it was time to do a book report, I'd find the thinnest book I could find in the library. <laughs> and here I am, I was uh, on, on the Fort Eustis base, you know, where I lived, it was a, most of the, you know, most of the uh, older people were military. And so I was at Fort Eustis and I was waiting for the bus and I went into the library, which is right across the street from the bus stop. And, um, you know, just browsing, just chilling, you know. And I came across this, this book, the autobiography of Malcolm X. It had Malcolm X on it speaking. It was a real big, thick book, like 300 something pages. And, um, you know, he, he was, I, I had heard the name Malcolm uh, a few years before, but didn't know nothing about him really. And, you know, I, uh, I picked up the book and I started reading it while, while, while I was waiting for the bus and ended up missing about two or three buses and then did the unspeakable. I checked out this big, thick book. <laughs> and um, I didn't put it down, I think, for the next couple of weeks. I read it twice then. I later rechecked it out and read it a third time. And, and what it did was it just opened up a new universe for me. Um, and it also introduced me to other people like Marcus Garvey, uh, Jay Rogers, whoever Malcolm mentioned in the book, 
I would find that person too. And then within, within the next few years, I read every book that had been published on Malcolm that I could get my hands on. And from that period forward, as my family would say, I was, I've been into that black stuff, that African <laughs> stuff. And it has helped to define, you know, um, you know, who I am. Um, my consciousness began to grow and it continues uh, to grow. But that was that was the catalyst. You know, it introduced me to the Black Panthers. And I read, you know, I, I read goo gobs of people uh, after I was introduced to um, to Malcolm X and. Um, you know, got in trouble too. Um, I, I will never forget, I was suspended one time from that school and my parents had to bring me back. So my mother brought me back. And I'll never forget this, we're in this meeting, you know, so that, you know, I can, you know, be readmitted to school. And this white teacher, redneck white teacher who had been discriminating against us since we got there, she's, she's talking to my mother and she says, by the by, in case you didn't know, she said, you know, talking about me, he's been reading Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. And I really think you and your husband need to, you know, watch what he reads. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's a white teacher, a redneck, racist white teacher, been discriminating against us since we've been there. And I never forget, my mother looks her in the eye. And she said, as a teacher, I would think that you would appreciate the fact that the boy reads. Uh -huh. No, we're not going to censor what he reads. We like the fact this boy is reading college books. We like that. So no, thank you. We will not censor. I remember that because it, it gave more validation to what I was doing. Uh -huh. Uh, how how old were you when you read the uh, uh, autobiography of Malcolm X? I was twelve. Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. In fact, I I just I just turned twelve actually, um, and um, yeah, you know, so you know, people react to different things, different stimuli, but for me, it was that, and then that was the beginning of a process that um, I've never left. Yeah. So that kind of set my, it set my course in this life, in this world, you know, as Fanon would say, you know, it, it, it helped to define my mission. Um, and uh, I've been there ever since. Yeah, you're quite fortunate to have had that exposure at that young age and then coming out of an African community, you had other things to give you backup, but that's quite an important thing. You know, I wear a goatee because Malcolm wore one. <laughs> and he's my second master. Garvey was my first, as you might have gathered from mm -hmm. the legacy of Malcolm X. Sure. And Malcolm was the second. I had already undergone an awakening that paralleled Malcolm's and only knew that after the autobiography came out because mine occurred in 63. And, uh, you know, the autobiography came out after Malcolm's assassination. So um, that's, that's very important because it means that um, your work has special meaning, you know, in terms not only on Malcolm, but the consciousness that was developed out of that and other life experiences would lend a lot to your work, you know? So, yeah, yeah interesting. And no telling how many millions of black folks he affected and not just in this country. I was in Tanzania working in the Ujamaa villages in 1973 and I'm on a train and this young Tanzanian is telling me about Malcolm and he was as energetic as <laughs> we are, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I mean, he had an in-depth understanding. Uh, what's your thought on the fact that because in fact, when I wrote the uh, political legacy of Malcolm X, I knew that there were missing chapters then. And that was, um, the book came out in uh, 1984. So I knew it earlier than that. So, so what's your view of that in relationship to the autobiography 
of Malcolm X, the fact that they were missing chapters right. and what's the implication of that? Yeah, um, this is the way, this is the way I look at the whole, you know, really Alex Haley, because that's really what we're really talking about here is, is Alex Haley. Um, what I had to learn to do is the autobiography, you know, very important book for me and for millions of other African people, like you just said. But we also have to be able to put it in context. And when we put it in context, we have to also accept the fact that the autobiography was not written by Malcolm X. It was written by Alex Haley. And unfortunately, and, you know, and, and this is the part of the, that I think a lot of us need to just be reminded of. Malcolm never read the autobiography of Malcolm X in its entirety. He went through our draft and he started marking it up. And Alex Haley didn't like that because his thing, his concern was that Malcolm was going to turn the autobiography into a weapon against Elijah Muhammad. Alex Haley's thing was he wanted to keep the original authenticity of it in which Malcolm was basically, you know, still in the nation and still basically worshiping Elijah Muhammad. And so what I think ended up happening is Alex Haley began to substitute his own, you know, uh, perspective, his own, um, I guess you could say Malcolm's, Malcolm's lens, if you will, in place of Malcolm's. And I think that that's something that we need to be critical of as serious minded African people. So in other words, my point is that the autobiography has its, has its problems, mostly because of Alex Haley. It's, it's, it's unfortunate you know, that Malcolm could not have written his own autobiography without a filter. But unfortunately we have to take the filter, you know, we have to take the autobiography with the good and the bad. And so my thing is, as long as we know that, as long as we know that the autobiography is not the final word on Malcolm X from Malcolm X's standpoint, as long as we know that Alex Haley is the filter, he's in between all of that. He's, he's tainting it in some ways, you know, he's, you know, you know, because one thing that I do agree with with, uh, uh, I guess it was, uh, I want to say it, it was Marable. I think it was Marable. But the point that they were making is that when we look at the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, we need to be sensitive as to, you know, what was, you know, like, in other words, if you don't trust Alex Haley, which, by the way, I really don't. I had the opportunity to interview Alex Haley when I was doing my research. And I don't know, it, it just, I think Alex Haley wanted to promote a, you know, similar to Manny Merle, but actually, he wanted to promote a certain sort of image of Malcolm. And that was the Malcolm who was into, you know, who was an, an integrationist, uh, a Malcolm who was trying to find his place in the civil rights movement, a Malcolm who was probably less sure of himself than he actually was. And I think, that's Alex Haley. So my thing is, you got to make a distinction between the spirit of Malcolm X that comes out of the autobiography and the sometimes the authenticity of it that I think you know is tainted by uh, Alex Haley. Yeah, because Alex Haley was um, a good writer, and he also wanted to do the human interest angle, but he was not political. Yeah. And so to even interpret Malcolm would be hard for him to do. And I think, you know, the integrationist thing, you're referring to the Mecca and all of that, that he made more of than was real. Yeah. Um, putting Malcolm in context, what do you see as uh, some of the major points that are important about Malcolm's contribution to history, his importance? both to African American history, world history, African history globally, and people around the world. What do you see as the significance of Malcolm and his legacy? Well, I think Malcolm's legacy has a lot of layers. 
a lot of layers to it. Um, let's start with the international. You know, I find it interesting that even today, you know, getting, you know, close to, you know, what is it? Uh, let's see. Let's see. Malcolm's killed in 65, 35. Uh, like, we're getting close to 60 years since Malcolm's assassination. And it amazes me how much um, how much Malcolm continues to affect and to impact people in the United States, in Canada, on the continent, in the Caribbean, even in Europe at this late date. And I think that to me is a tribute, you know, to you know, uh, to several things. A, his analytical skills. You know, Malcolm was one of the sharpest people of his day. Um, one of the things that I always studied Malcolm for was how Malcolm basically was able to train his mind. You know, he, um, he was self-educated. He taught himself, which I think is the best tool anyway. Um, I'm reminded of something that Queen Mother Moore used to say, you know, you remember Queen Mother Moore quit school in the third grade. And she's always joked that that she still stayed in school too long to learn anything. <laughs> and I think that in Malcolm's case, you know, you have somebody who, you know, basically dropped out in the ninth grade, but then educated himself, picked up the ball himself. And in the process, he developed a mind that was disciplined, you know, a mind that could absorb information very quickly and process it very quickly. So first and foremost, I think Malcolm's analytical skills, you know, like when, when you saw Malcolm in interviews in this country and he, you know, and often or when he was debating somebody, because normally they would try to put him up against either some white Bait, uh, you know, some some white person or oftentimes a Negro. Uh, and basically, Malcolm generally ate them all for lunch because his mind was so disciplined. And so I've used Malcolm, you know, for my own, you know, mindset, you know, you know, because the mind is like a muscle. And I think Malcolm knew that. And he knew that one of the greatest weapons that he could ever use against our enemies was this right here. So I think that's one of the things that people admire about Malcolm because they listen to his speeches. They listen to the interviews. They see how sharp, how, you know, how, how, how quick his wit was. And I think that that's one of the major, um, you know, attributes that separates Malcolm. But also I think the politics of Malcolm. Remember this, Malcolm was saying things, you know, in the 60s. In, actually in the late 50s and into the 60s until his assassination, he was saying things that the average brother or sister, the perspective of it, the analysis of it, they hadn't thought about it. They hadn't went there, you know? And in fact, I would suggest to you that in, 19, in 1965 and before, uh, I can't think of one person who from a thinking standpoint and a political standpoint that I think was on the same level as Malcolm. You know, uh, I respect Martin Luther King, but I don't think King had even the analytical uh, analysis, you know, capability that Malcolm X had. Um, and, and I don't care about degrees and, and all that stuff, that's irrelevant. Uh, Malcolm, to me, was in a class all by himself. And then, of course, the other thing that I think separates Malcolm was his critiques. Remember, Malcolm gave critiques of the United States during, a, you know, and we're in the midst of the Cold War. He was giving critiques, you know, that superseded what Russia was trying to say superseded what China was, you know, was trying to say, the steel curtain and all those countries that were critical of the United States. Malcolm penetrated them more deeply than any of those countries. Um, 
because you know he he just he had that perception he had that sensitivity and i think that's something else that separates malcolm you know from from everybody else and then the final thing that i'll say on this is that nobody gave the critical analysis of the united states more thoroughly than malcolm x you know the hypocrisy for example because remember the united states then and now is trying to masquerade around the world as being, you know, a believer in justice and all that stuff. Malcolm destroyed all of that. He could see the hypocrisy. And more importantly, he was willing to talk about the hypocrisy. So I, I just think just things like that, you know, it just, it just separated Malcolm from all of the other, you know, leaders of the era all of the other activists of the era. You know, he was just, to me, he, he was in a class by himself. Well put. Uh, I would add um, that what really um, made much of this disciplined mind and this analytical ability, aside from his own natural brilliance was the awakening process that he went through uh, in prison and uh, he often described it this way. He said, first your philosophy changes, then your attitude pattern changes, then right. your thought pattern changes, communication pattern changes, and behavior pattern changes. And you could take a picture of Malcolm when he was on the streets and he looked like he was in that life, someone you wouldn't trust at a certain point. And you could look at Malcolm when he underwent transformation in stages. When he first goes into the nation, he almost looks like um, a monk. I mean, somebody who's just dealing with the necessary essentials. His whole concern is on his mission. You know what I mean? But there was a transformation process that he underwent. And personally, I think that he wasn't conscious of this it put him on a collision course with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because the messenger had a transformation that he had that he contributed to Malcolm, which was religious, spiritual. But Malcolm had a political, a historical, a social, an economic, a philosophical, and most people don't note it until um, his family started writing about him, the uh, seventh child, uh, that the books that he read in prison that were relevant came from his family, black books. The other books were the prison library. So that conversion, that transformation, I think was key. And I think that leaders that underwent that transformation or members in the black liberation movement had much more to contribute than those that didn't, you know? Yeah. I have a picture in, behind me of Amos Carr Cabral he underwent that same transformation. And they both came out of the assimilated mindset and in Malcolm's so-called criminal, you know, uh, in the beginning. So those are perceptive observations you got because that mind of his, John Henry Clark would say, he was the most brilliant mind that we produced in the 20th century. I would say the most brilliant political mind, you know, it, without a doubt. And, and he could beat people in a debate without debating them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he was he was he was special. You know, it, it was it was remarkable. I think just to kind of just to kind of watch Malcolm. And the thing that we want to be careful is that it's easy, I think, to become infatuated with Malcolm's personality. But I think that to me, it wasn't the personality, it wasn't the charisma, and and all those things that. Right you know, many of us get caught up on, it's when you hear this man say what he say and you analyze what he say and you put it under a microscope, you say, damn, you know, why didn't I think of that? And I think that's what, you know, one of the criteria that I've always used, you know, as a, you know, as a, you know, uh, African, you know, uh, race man, you know, as an African revolutionary is, I've always been fascinated by people who say things and I ask myself the question, why didn't I think of that? That tells me that's like the ultimate of, you know, the, the ultimate analysis 
when I can say about somebody, God, why didn't I think of that? And I say that for Malcolm on so many levels, starting as a child, but even as a grown up, you know, and, 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 and that's always ser served as a litmus test for me of just how special, you know, Malcolm X is. It's like when I read Enemies for the first time by Hakeem Adabuti, mm -hmm. and I'm reading and I'm saying to myself, damn, what an analysis. Why didn't I think of that? Why couldn't I see that? Or when I was reading Vincent Hardy, There is a River, you know, it's like, wow, why didn't I look at that like that? Mm -hmm. And so with Malcolm, it, it was it was just so many of those. And so in so many ways, you know, he taught me, you know, as a young person. And even as I got old, it was like, you know, this this was one of my teachers because it's like I'm reading what this guy is saying in a speech or you know, sometimes in autobiography, and I'm saying to myself, wow, I wish I would have thought of that. Mm -hmm. But it's forcing me to another level of analysis, another level of consciousness. And you can't duplicate that. You know, you, you can't say that about a lot of people. Yeah, but yeah. I consistently used to say that about Malcolm. Wow. Why didn't I think of that? Um, yeah, he was original, creative <clears throat> and original and thought outside the box and boundaries set by this country. John Henry Clark, who was an advisor to him, he gave one example. He said Malcolm called him a number of times because he was an advisor on African issues and stuff. And so he had a debate with some formal scholars on the Congo and colonialism in the Congo and whatnot. And so he called John because <clears throat> he knew that he needed more information. Mm -hmm. John gave him basically uh, the soliloquy on the Congo, the work by Mark Twain and some other stuff. He said, Malcolm read that in a few minutes, went on and cleaned the clock of the so-called experts on the Congo. <laughs> <laughs> but he was an in-depth reader. But in this particular case, <clears throat> you know, when he had to brief himself quick, he was able to absorb information. He had enough other information to just knock his opponents out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, another quality of him is, as brilliant as he was, he also drew on people that had good ideas because the organization Afro-American Unity, he had some brilliant African-American scholars shaping his, you know, platform and other stuff. So um brilliant as he was, he was constant. And, and, and key thing is he was a reader. He read all the time. And he was reading stuff some of us still haven't read. There's a book by Lerone Bennett, Negro Mood, later called Black Mood. Have you heard of that book? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, used to, I used to love some, some uh, Lerone Bennett. Mm -hmm. In fact, I used one of his books uh, when I was at Bowie uh, for a couple semesters. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was uh, Black Power USA. Mm -hmm. And I think also used before the Mayflower. But it, anyway, I didn't mean it to uh, interrupt you. No, no, go ahead. This is a conversation. <laughs> You're going to be doing the depth on the assassination, not me. But this <laughs> is a conversation. I was uh, in Selma in uh, 65, and it was the end of my period in the so called civil rights movement. We had just uh -huh. cleaned clocks in the San Francisco freedom movement. And I was a uh, March Marshal, and so Bennett was there, and Bennett would come to our national convention. So, and I was also at the Million Man March, and Bill, Bennett was up on the stage, and so I, I asked him a question. I knew his answer. What's your best book? I knew what he would say. Negro Mood. It's only about 120 pages. Malcolm had read that. <laughs> so I remember seeing in. Um, one of the Socialist Workers Party publications, Malcolm holding the book, and I looked at what was the title? Negro Mood. Two chapters in there, The Black Establishment and Voices from the Cave. And um, that made that book a classic. But Malcolm was reading and digging all the time. He didn't have much time to sleep. I think it was four hours. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, amazing. I mean, amazing. And, and you're right, not to get caught up in the personality or idolize, idolize the personality. He's a human being. Right. You know? And I'm sure we'll get into some of his uh, human traits and human qualities. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this one, but uh, Manning Marble in his book on Malcolm, 
uh, he characterized, his book was on the reinvention uh, of Malcolm. He characterized Malcolm as basically someone who was reinventing himself in a way to mean falsely. So <clears throat> what's your view of that? Yeah, um, I think that many Marables made the same mistake that, that, that uh, Alex Haley made with Malcolm. It's like they want to portray Malcolm in a way that supports and validates their particular perspective when it comes to race, when it comes to struggle, when it comes to, you know, even American society. So, you know, I understood what Marable was trying to say because, you know, his whole thing too was that, you know, Malcolm was in, Malcolm was in a transformation, you know, and at the time of his assassination, well, Malcolm told you that, you know, he was working on, you know, some new directions anyway. But everything we know about Malcolm says that the direction, you know, was going to be toward Black nationalism, toward Pan-Africanism. He wasn't headed toward, you know, we shall overcome and let's lock arms. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what the Mary <clears throat> Marables, I think that's what the Alex Haley's, you know, that's what they want for Malcolm. And then any little bit, you know, that he might have said something here, you know, kind of like what, what Brightman them did with the socialist you know, with the Associates Workers Party, you know, uh, the militant, you know, anytime Malcolm said something about capitalism or said something about greed or something like that, then they use that as evidence that Malcolm was evolving into a socialist. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that mm -hmm. um, basically Haley, Haley would kind of like do the same thing. And what they wanted to see, you know, of Malcolm was that Malcolm was going to go more toward integrationism, assimilationism, uh, and, you know, let's all be American and, and all that type of stuff. But, you know, there's nothing substantive in Malcolm that, that supported that. But I think, you know, Malcolm is one of those few people that, that many people want him to be, you know, they want to identify with him. And so they want him to be, you know, you know, molded in a way that they can support him. Mm -hmm. So for Malcolm, you know, it's that integrationist stuff. He wanted black people, white people to, you know, lock arms and see we we should overcome. But that's not Malcolm. <clears throat> you know, it's OK for King, but that's really not that's not Malcolm X. But I think that's what Haley and uh, your boy, uh, you know, Marable, I think that's kind of like where they were where they were going with that. Yeah. <clears throat> Marable would take some exaggerations of Malcolm, like his exaggeration of his criminal life, to then use this or failing to tell certain things about what happened when he was arrested for burglary and his role in other people being arrested, to then paint a broad brush to say he was reinventing himself, when in fact, Malcolm was a revolutionary in the nation and outside, but he was growing. He was transforming, reinventing nothing was transformation, real radical transformation, you know? Uh, exactly. So, yeah. Um, you uh, did consulting work on the film on uh, Malcolm X that Spike Lee did. Um, describe that and, and your view on the film itself. Well, I mean, you know, I think the film, you know, was a Hollywood production. <clears throat> and I think whenever you're dealing with Hollywood, um, you know, it, it will not be authentic or it will not be authentic enough. You know, in film school, they teach film students to be what they call, you know, to practice economy. Uh, instead of introducing a whole bunch of, of uh, you know actors, you know for different scenes, you know get one person doing multiple, you know things that other people did. That way, you don't have to introduce a new character for your, you know, uh, viewer to be confused by. And if you look at that particular film, you know, like one of the things that Spike did is he had one character in the film 
who in real life, he did things that in real life, five different characters or people did. And so, you know, when you bring in those types of, uh, you know, uh, you know, because people like me, I don't care about Hollywood. I don't care about films. All I'm looking for is to present an accurate portrait of the person that you're, you know, just probably a bio. So just do that. And if you can't do that, then to me, it's not going to be authentic. It's not going to be, you know, it's, it's entertainment but it's not entertainment. And I think that the role of, you know, if you're gonna do a biop, now it's different if you're doing a film, a drama, and you know, a thriller and all those things, that's different. But if you're gonna do a biop, then you need to be accurate in your thing. And you can't bring in stuff, you know, to me, that's not, that's not accurate, you know, even with the characters and stuff. So. You know, that's that's my problem. And, you know, if, if we want, why don't we use this as a sedge for the Malcolm X, for the for that Netflix thing? You know, because I know we said we want to talk about that. And to me, it's kind of it's kind of similar, um, you know, as far as accuracy is concerned, you know, because I just think that the way that that Netflix thing was done, you um, you know, it's it's kind of interesting. You know, it took me a while once I saw it. You know, I saw it one time and then I could only see it one more time. But when I saw it the second time, I realized what they did with the Netflix thing. If you look at some of Gates's films, you know, he's kind of like this unassuming, non-threatening, you know, um, don't have to take too serious narrator. You know, he's vulnerable. He might snap a joke here and there as a narrator. But you feel comfortable listening to him as he narrates because, because you're not taking him too serious. And I think that was the role that Muhammad played in the Netflix thing. He was basically Gates. And in fact, his energy was like Gates. And I think that what they were basically trying to do is they tried to, you know, present Malcolm. Um, you know, they they falsely put out a narrative that said that everybody thought that Butler and Johnson, you know, were guilty, and that everybody thought, you know, that the right men were in prison for Malcolm's assassination. And everybody thought that Newark didn't have anything to do with it. And huh. so basically stuff that, that was already out there through research by people like me and you, we'd already put this stuff out there. And so by them portraying this as if this is something new. So Muhammad is coming with something different. He's coming with something new. And therefore, it's going to turn everything upside down on what we know about Malcolm X. When in fact, all Muhammad did was just reiterated what we had long put out there. Uh, and in fact, as I was telling you when we were talking earlier, as I analyzed that film for the second time, it was real clear to me that there was actually nothing of substance that was in that film that I had not already covered it or some other researcher had not covered it. Mm -hmm. And when I say nothing, I mean absolutely nothing. So the problem with that film, and I'm, I'm reminded of an African proverb that basically goes, you know, to he who does not know, a garden is a forest. And I think that the problem with that film is that it presupposed that these were the standard beliefs that a lot of people have. And so anything that they do that's different from that is a major contribution. Is, you know, you know they are redefining and uncovering new information. And, and, you know, and, and so the problem with that film is that it's misleading to start, but 
also, you know, it's like they have overblown its overall contribution. It's nothing new there. Um, and when I say nothing new, I really mean that there's nothing new. You know, and, and you know, even him talking about the killers, you know, there were, you know, first you got to deal with Hare talked about the killers in his affidavit in 1977. Tony Brown talked about the killers when he interviewed Hare. In 1979, Peter Goldman did a, a uh, added a, uh, an afterthought chapter in which he interviewed Hare in prison. And so they dealt with the killer. So my point is, is that this is, this is the historical reality. But when you watch that film, you get the impression that none of this ever happened, but that Muhammad was, you know, thought that something was wrong. And then he took it upon himself to go. And then he uncovered information about the true killers. Absurd. And, you know, basically, um, Skip Gates, knew what he was doing, that his thing was to not really rely on serious scholarship. You should have been a central person. And is it Paul Lee? Yeah. Yeah, Paul Lee. But you especially should have been the central person on this since your work is definitive. But you were kind of put to the sideline and the person who's talking has no real substance, you know, and yeah. has nothing that he's contributed to the field at all. I, I was having trouble staying awake. I watched it, but it was like in my days, I got the message. You know what I mean? Right. I didn't know that it was uh, Skip Gates that had produced it. Maybe I started after it started. Right. And see, I didn't know that either. Um, I found out that it was Skip Gates after they filmed me for the last time, because if I would have known that in advance, I would not have participated. And let me make one other point that I also want to make sure um, that I make. Um, you were talking about how, when it came to me, how the film dealt with me. You know, I thought about this once I saw it the second time and I, I understood their dilemma. See, they had a problem with me in this film. And this was the dilemma. They needed my scholarship you know, and of course, Muhammad's so-called scholarship is based on my scholarship, which he used to always tell me how my book was the gold standard and before my book, blah, blah, blah. Of course, none of that comes out in the film. But this was the dilemma that they had. They had already decided that the narrative was going to be that Muhammad was a lone ranger. That he took it upon himself to uncover the truth about Malcolm's assassination. So that automatically meant that even though they could use my scholarship, they could not identify me and my book because they had to choose between, you know, in other words, if my book exists and they acknowledge the existence of my book and the information that's in my book is the information, you know, that that this guy is talking about, I'm talking about Muhammad is talking about in his narrative, then that would have destroyed their narrative because their thing was Muhammad came across this stuff. He uncovered this information. You don't have the thesis of their particular you know, narrative is exploded if Zach Kondo did that 20 something years before in his book then you then it would destroy Muhammad as this lone crusader uncovering the truth that nobody else had been able to uncover. So they had to, so that's why they can't identify me in the film as an author. They can't identify the name of my book, nor can they say anything really about my scholarship in general. Because if you if you identify me, then you don't have the narrative with him. That narrative is shot. So I basically would have to be used by research with me in it, but I then become invisible. So basically I'm in the film, but I am invisible as far as who I am. Like you watch that and you don't know nothing about my, me as a scholar. You don't know nothing 
about my work in Malcolm X because all of that would have undermined what their thesis was and their narrative was for Muhammad. Yeah, now that's well put because Muhammad is portrayed as this guy, I think he was doing his little work on the little bus that he mm -hmm. whatever, and he's somebody who's done all this digging. He hasn't written anything. There's no evidence of anything that he's uncovered that's serious, but that is the Harvard project. The Harvard project is to pretty much cover our history and obliterate it. I mean, <laughs> literally. Yeah. Because as we're building African centered studies, Black right. studies, it's radical and militant. Then they have what they call the dream team over at Harvard. And, and I have no objection if, even though it's at Harvard and they brainwash you at Harvard real well. But if you got some good scholars there, no problem. Is this W.B. Du Bois? Definitely no problem. But here's somebody who comes along that doesn't even have the courage to put his department on an independent basis. He's subordinate at Harvard and is being used as an attack dog against Afrocentricity. When Leonard Jeffries was putting down a strong position, City College in New York, he's being attacked by Harvard. When they're trying to destroy black studies at San Francisco State, I'm leading the fight against it. Here comes Skip Gates out to have dinner with the president. And what does he say? He never heard of black studies at San Francisco State. We gave birth to black studies at four year uh, universities and Merritt did through the Black Panthers first at a two year college. You know what I mean? You never heard right. of either one of those, huh? You know, so right. yeah. There's a deliberate effort to bury you because it's a radical voice. And this thing that he's done recently on the black church, it looks good on the surface. But if you go underneath it, what he's done is while there's some interesting timelines and the last show is dealing with the hip hop generation, their alienation from the church and blah, blah. And he's got uh, um, the uh, minister for Barack Obama, uh, Jeremiah Wright speaking. Is a good brother. But what he buries in that show when he looks at the black church is the African basis for African-American spirituality, which is the basis for the real black church. It's buried, it's lost, <laughs> you know? So right. on the surface, there's a lot of stuff that good to know, a lot of good singing and different things, a lot of visuals, but underneath he's whitewashed your history. You don't know it. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah. And, and, right. And I think historically, I think that has been the role that he has played. And I think technically that's the role that Harvard's Black Studies basically yeah. stays, you know, yeah. you know, plays. I mean, you know, if we're being serious. Yeah. yeah you definitely. know, you know, because he's not there to empower African people. He's not there to liberate African people. You know, that's not what what the Gates mission is, you know. His mission is just to integrate us into, you know, white America and get that white American validation and stuff. But you know, he's he ain't, you know, he he ain't about African people. Yeah. You know, and and let's be honest, you know, we don't have to, you know, blow it out of proportion. But I think to go back to what I said earlier, I don't know if, if I said it for the camera or if it just me and you were talking, but I was making a point that when I was in um doing consultant work with, uh, with um, you know, Black Side during the early 1990s, at that stage of the game, you know, and, and, and I had to go to Boston, you know, to the Cambridge area, every last person who was in Harvard's Black Studies program married white, every last one of them. So for someone like me, I mean, you know, and you, that says a whole lot about the personhood of the person who's hiring them because we, you know, we know Gates was hiring them. Mm -hmm. So what does that say? You know, what does that tell you about his mentality, but also about the mentality of the faculty there? And yet we're supposed to give them validation because they're Harvard, like Harvard has done something for African people historically. So we're supposed to validate Harvard or some of those other places, really? Yeah. Right. Or, or someone that puts down the black arts movement. You know what I mean? 
uh, talking about it, it really doesn't have any real validity. I mean, you know, some of our best artists who were not in the black arts movement were shaped by it and yeah. say so. But a, a, a real independent arts movement financed by, organized by black folks, not by foundations or anything else and produces a Sonia Sanchez and a Mary Baraka, Skia Mohamed Touré and a host of others. And then, uh, you know, the more prominent public poets and artists who acknowledge that a lot of their work was inspired by that. You know what I mean? And he's going to put that down? You know, uh-uh, nah, uh-uh. Um, now, in, um, in The Judas Factor, uh, Evans uh, makes note of something that I thought was important. He noted Malcolm's connection to Paul Robeson, you know, in prison. And I, I noted your... Um, reflections on him in your book. Uh, what do you see as uh, Paul Robeson's impact on Malcolm's thinking? Yeah, I think, I think what's significant when you look at the evolution of Malcolm's thinking is that think about who was Malcolm drawn, you know, drawn to the most. Malcolm was drawn to those Africans who were A, to the left, B, these were basically warriors that white people labeled in a negative way. That's who Malcolm was drawn to. That's why it's no accident that his family and Malcolm himself had appreciation for Marcus Garvey. You know, there were other people that he could have been drawn to that he wasn't. He was drawn to those brothers and sisters who were trying to shake things up. Now we can debate, you know, different levels when it comes to, you know, Du Bois. Du Bois was complex, you know, uh, you know, like when you study, you know, his his conflict with uh, Garvey and some of the sabotage and some of that stuff. You know, uh, you know, we need to talk about accountability and stuff. But even with someone like Du Bois, it was always somebody to the left. So my point is, is that Malcolm was always drawn to those brothers and sisters who were shaking things up that will ultimately be him. In other words, he's drawn to people who will basically, you know, you know, the same footsteps that he will walk into are the people that Malcolm was most drawn to, you know, and therefore someone like a Paul Robeson someone like a Garvey, you know, someone like a Hubert Harrison and people like that, those are the people that's gonna get Malcolm's attention. People, you know, in Harlem, you know, the people who just pull up, uh, you know, uh, what do they call them? Those, uh, the, the preachers with the, when they bring their own little, um, you know, uh, platform. Right. I can't think of it, but yes. those are the people who caught Malcolm's attention because those people were talking about things that the average brother and sister was not going to talk about. Uh -huh. Yeah, and you know, I think that's that's real important because we're going to get into the Nation of Islam and Malcolm. Uh, but the fact that um, Robeson was opposed to the Korean War, uh, Malcolm was the first, as you pointed out in your book, to oppose the war in Vietnam, major leader. Robeson was about bringing the US before the UN. The UN, yeah. Exactly. Violations on genocide. And when Malcolm would take his position on human rights, he'd often slip and say genocide. <laughs> exactly. Like dipping exactly. into Robeson's bag. And then um, Malcolm got a lot of his stuff on animal analogies, partially from uh, Michelle, Michelle's bookstore, but also from Paul Robeson, you know what I mean? And uh, so, you know, but, but I think there's a kinship, as you say, to the left, he's drawn to radicals. Yeah. And, uh, you can't get much more radical, manly, or bad than Paul Robeson. And, no. and he said he was one of his greatest, if not his greatest hero. And he only got to meet him once, you know, just briefly, you know what I mean? So that's often ignored 
that black Superman called Paul Robeson. I mean, there was a Superman. That was one, you know what I mean? A right. man of integrity. And he had that, you know what I mean? He had that. Now, Elijah Muhammad, as, as Malcolm's in prison um, and he undergoes, he's starting to undergo a transformation. Um, you know, he's, his family is in the nation and so forth. What do you see, what do you see as the, um, the value that Malcolm saw in Elijah and, um, and what attracted him to Elijah and the nation? Yeah. yeah, well, first I would I would start with the earlier analysis. You know, the nation of Islam was also to the left, you know, and I'm not talking about from a standpoint of capitalism versus socialism, that type of stuff, but they were to the left. They were, they were not mainstream from a religious standpoint within our community. So I think that was the first draw. I think, I think some of the other draws is that the nation came forth with a racial platform. And I think Malcolm was at a stage then in which the whole racialism, you know, of reality was smacking him in the face. And so a lot of Mohammedan came forward and they talked about, you know, uh, you know, about uh, they had a a a um, origin story that had black versus white and white, you know, being, you know, in a negative light. That was something very unusual. I think Malcolm was drawn to that type of assessment as well. But I think once you get past that, I think Malcolm, you know, found in Elijah Muhammad the father that he was robbed of. And I think that it's easy to underestimate that, you know, the relationship, the sociological relationship part that kind of brought Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad together. Malcolm needed that paternalism. Because think about it, in his lifetime, he really didn't know it. You know, he grew up without having that strong African, you know, male energy. And I think Elijah Muhammad fit, you know, you know, you know, his, you know, it fit the mold for Malcolm and stuff. So I, I think that, you know, that was a major draw for Malcolm. I think the other thing that was important that the nation presented is that, you know, it was basically African people, because think about it, Malcolm has spent his lifetime uh, seldom seeing African people in positions of strength. And yet within the nation of Islam, he sees this organized structure. He sees respect within the community, like, you know, amongst African people. He sees this image, this strong positive image that he hadn't seen very much on the streets. And I think that that was also a draw. And of course, it, it certainly helped that his family, you know, like all of them, you know, like his whole damn family had pretty much fell under the spell as well. And I think that was a certain level of validation, I think, that a Malcolm, you know, th that was important to Malcolm at that time, too. Because remember, it was all of his brothers, all his siblings had basically, you know, drank the Kool-Aid. And I think that was important for Malcolm, you know, during that time in his life. Of course, you know, as time goes on, it's going to, you know, get a little bit rocky and there's going to be negative energy and there's going to be a split and all that within the family. But I think all of these things made the nation, you know, it, oh, and then finally, it gave Malcolm direction. Because see, I think Malcolm was a brother who constantly was looking for direction. I think the whole gangster life, you know, was him looking for direction. Him being, you know, in and out of, of trouble was looking for direction. Even when he was in prison, trying to decide which corner he was going to turn deciding that he was going to teach himself, you know, how to read and write and, and to read a whole lot of serious books. I think all of that was Malcolm's way of saying, I'm looking for direction. And I think, you know, the Nation of Islam and Elijah Muhammad pretty much, you know, checked off all those boxes at that stage of Malcolm's life. You know, he's, he's going to be coming out of prison soon. Where do you go from here? You know, and I think that he ultimately found that there was a deeper meaning in his life, you know, beyond just being a gangster, 
you know, or another statistic. And I think the Nation of Islam was able to, you know, to fill that void. And it was a very important void for Malcolm. Now, those are good insights. You know, one thing I like about your writing style is you're very concise and you, you pull together a lot of details. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and we're <laughs> going to come back into the boom, boom in a minute. I just want to riff off of a few of your points. Uh, the father figure. I think that there there's no way to underestimate that. And um, one of the things I note in my book is that to understand Malcolm is to understand that family was his foundation. It was really his foundation. It isn't for everybody. It's not for me. I'm a world person. My brother was a family man. He remembered everything about the family, everything seen through the family. And if you look at Malcolm, um, who recruits him into the nation of Islam? It's his family. You know what I mean? Um, and as you say, Elijah Muhammad was a father figure for him and real because he was a corporal in the Garvey movement, his father and mother, both playing a major role in the Garvey movement. And at every shift, when, when he's in the streets, that's family. Shorty is family, comes from the same area. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah, family's fundamental to him. And, and even when you get into the hard periods that he goes through with the nation, being separated from family was rough on him. I mean, that was rough on him. The other thing about, you know, you know your point about strength, that he saw strength and uh, he, he, he was to the left. You know, the nation was in rebellion against the standard definitions mm -hmm. that the society provides for blacks. Even when he was in the streets, um, he was in a form of rebellion that was confused, but it was rebellion. Yeah, it, it was. And that's a good point. You know, I've got technically, what are they? They're exploiters. They're trying to exploit a system, you know, that's not working for them. So how do you make this system work for you? Right. You know, you do the underhanded stuff. You know, you you do the, you know, the, um, oh, what's the word that they like to use? The, the un, you know, the, yeah, the, the underground stuff. But that's an exploitation of the system. Mm -hmm. And hustling. There's because because the way he described it in the autobiography, that was the art of hustling, and he may have exaggerated some stuff, <clears throat> but you know <laughs> he's talking about guys who, who had games and stuff like that, you know. So now when he wakes up, then it's it's beyond gaming, he's into really using this stuff. But it was a form of gaming. He was using his mind in a certain way. It wasn't where it should have been, and and some revealing stuff too that when he's in the streets, he also would occasionally talk about uh, Marcus Garvey. So it wasn't like his mind was completely off of the upbringing that he got uh, from his mother and from his father, you know? Exactly. Uh, in, in terms of Elijah and Malcolm, because th there's a continuum and this is a complexity, but um, what, what did those two bring to this relationship? Um, Elijah, in, in addition to being a father figure, what were the things that, what were his strengths? What were some of the things that um, his orientation was centered around? And Malcolm, his, and underneath that, how did they work together and how did they pose problems? Right. Well, I think that both of them brought, and I talk about this in, in my book, both of both of them brought something to the table that fed the other one. Malcolm, for example, Malcolm, Elijah Muhammad brought him wisdom. He brought him, you know, that strong male energy. He brought Malcolm discipline because the organization revolved around discipline and Malcolm was in need of discipline. He also, you know, he also brought Malcolm solutions. Elijah Muhammad, you know, because he had a program, he offered solutions and, 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 and Malcolm was at that stage in his life in which he needed solutions. He needed possibilities. He needed direction. And these were the things that Elijah Muhammad brought him. Flip side, what did Malcolm bring Elijah Muhammad? Well, he brought Elijah Muhammad extraordinary energy, you know, 
you know, Malcolm was, was an incredibly hard, hard worker. And Elijah Muhammad had not seen a worker like Malcolm. He always complained in, in relation to his children that they were lazy compared to Malcolm, that his children, you know, um, you know, wouldn't take it to the next level like Malcolm did. You know, he would always compare them, you know, why can't y'all be more like Malcolm? He always is sensitive to my needs, unlike my own children. So that's one of the things that Malcolm brought to the table. You know, he brought, you know, um, analysis, you know, because Elijah Muhammad, I thought, Elijah Muhammad thought well, you know, for someone, you know, with his background and everything, but Malcolm thought a lot more logical, a lot more, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, sensible, if you will, and stuff. And so Malcolm's analysis, I think, helped to, you know, balance Elijah Muhammad's wisdom. And so, and so what you're gonna see happening here is a marriage, if you will, between uh, Elijah Muhammad's wisdom married with Malcolm's logic and sense of, you know, and sense of logic. And I think that made, you know, the nation and their relationship that much more effective, if you will. Um, I think Malcolm also brought a youthful vision. You know, Elijah Muhammad, uh, by the time they hooked up, you know, he was already, you know, you know, he, he could have been on most elders, you know, you know, elder, elder councils and stuff when they first hooked up. But I think that what Malcolm, or what, oh, okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm talking about what, yeah, I'm talking about what, what Malcolm brought, right? Yeah, right, right. So one of the most important things that I think Malcolm brought was he brought that youthful energy of fresh ideals, you know, because remember, Malcolm, for Malcolm, a lot of this stuff is new. You know, he had never been in an organization, organization like the Nation of Islam. He was, he never had to demonstrate the type of discipline that he had to demonstrate in the nation in his previous life. Yeah, I mean, you could make an argument that, well, on the street, there is a certain discipline that you needed to have, you know, on the street. But the type of discipline that he has to exert within the Nation of Islam that was all new. And I think that Elijah Muhammad, you know, you know, needed that type of youth. It was, it was a good, you know, it was, it was a good sort of youth that I think, you know, improved the nation of Islam. And then the other thing, the final thing that I'll say is remember, Malcolm was an organizer. And at the time that he and Elijah Muhammad hooked up, one of the major things things that the nation needed was organizers. Because remember, before Malcolm, there was only a handful of temples across the country. When Malcolm gets on the case with his energy and his commitment and all of that, there's going to be, you know, 10 and 20 and 30 more temples that are going to be founded all over the country, primarily because of Malcolm's youth, and because of his organizational skills. Malcolm had extraordinary organizational skills. And I think that's exactly what Elijah Muhammad needed at that time. And one of the points that I make in my book is that one without the other probably would not have went as far, but the two of them together, bringing to the table the different skills that they had made Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad an extraordinary combination. Yeah, and those organizing skills were exceptional. Uh, they really were. He and I think he and Elder Baker were the two best organizers we produced in the second half of the 20th century. I used to say Malcolm, but I'm working on a book now and Elder Baker is one of the masters. You really can't say that because when you look at Elder Baker's work, it's a different kind of organizing but you can't put one on top of the other. Those two are the best. And I think that the kind of organization that the nation was, was suited to Malcolm's approach to organizing, which yeah, is exactly. highly disciplined, highly structured, stay in your place. I mean, this was a guy who is disciplining older people over weight. You got to stand on a scale. And if you don't <laughs> meet a certain weight, right. 
and uh, coming down on some of his best people when they did something wrong and putting them down and, and insisting on people staying in their place, which would also be put on him later. But yeah. that fit the model. So yeah, these are, uh, these are real good observations on your part. Um, now, because you know, we're setting the, uh, you know, the stage for discussing this assassination piece. Um, so what were some of the differences you know, in terms of Elijah's views of how things should go for black folks and Malcolm's? There were similarities and they were differences. And where did some of these differences pose problems? Yeah, well, I would, I would start by saying politically. You know, Malcolm, Malcolm politically had a vision that was very different than Elijah Muhammad's vision. Malcolm's vision was for the nation. You know, like, remember, he, he would talk about how it used to bother him when rank and file brothers and sisters would say, the nation talks stuff, but they don't do nothing. You know, they criticize people, but they're not in the streets. So Malcolm's vision was for the nation to get in the streets. He wanted them to be active in struggle. He wanted them to put what they, you know, preached, you know, he wanted to see them operate the type of stuff that they preach. Elijah Muhammad, on the other hand, he wanted the nation to be not a political movement. He wanted it simply to be a religious movement. There are probably different reasons for that. One of my contentions is that I think Elijah Muhammad didn't want to bring more attention on the nation um, for financial reasons, but also I think he feared that the FBI and you know some of the enemies, you know, institutions would um, would would come after the nation, and I think that you know um, you know he feared that. Um, as much as they talked a whole lot of things, I think Elijah Muhammad knew that they had built a nice, you know, structure for himself and for his family. And I think anything that threatened that was problematic for him. And I think Malcolm, you know, as Malcolm got more political, particularly in 63, when he was trying to pull the nation further into civil rights and self-defense, and those types of things, him and Elijah Muhammad, you know, started, you know, getting more and more distance um, between them. So certainly that was, you know, that was a problem. I think some of the other problems is that, you know, Malcolm started, you know, you know, he had more of an interest in internationalism, uh, particularly as it pertained to Africa and also as it pertained to the Islamic world. And so I think between those two things, Elijah Muhammad was uncomfortable. You know, uh, he was, and let's be clear on this. He was always uncomfortable with Africa. Right. You know, I remember reading some articles uh, from uh, Muhammad Speaks. Uh, in, uh, in, in fact, uh, if anybody wants to look it up, the, it would, should be June the 28th, 1968. Uh, Elijah Muhammad wrote an article well, uh, that was published in the uh, in Muhammad speak, Speaks, in which what he was doing was he was chastising members of the nation who were wearing dashikis. He was chastising people who were trying to identify, members of the nation who were trying to identify with African culture. He even used words like foreign, you know, and trying to use foreign <laughs> names and different things like that. But the point is that it reminded you that uh, that Elijah Muhammad's perspective when it came to Africa was a hell of a lot different than his, you know, than Malcolm's perspective when it came, you know, to uh, to Africa. And and then the other thing too, with in relation to the Islamic world, Malcolm was interested in, you know, in bringing the nation in the Islamic world, you know, seeing the nation play a more active role in the Islamic world. Whereas I think Elijah Muhammad was not comfortable, you know, on that particular stage. I, I don't think he was comfortable, probably for a multitude of reasons. But it just seems real clear that he was he was not comfortable with that. And and I think 
from his mindset, he saw Malcolm as trying to force things, force the nation to get out of its comfort zone. And remember too, Malcolm was also interested in making better use of the F4Y. Because his thing was, what's the use of having a paramilitary organization or structure within our organization if we really, you know, don't use it, you know, because there was a time when he would have liked for them to kind of like do what the deacons for defense and justice did, you know, to protect the civil rights movement and, you know, in the South and marches and stuff like that. Malcolm had visions of stuff like that for, for the nation. Um, but I think that, you know, clearly a lot of Muhammad was uncomfortable taking the nation out of its, you know, more traditional a uh, role uh, and to try to make it more of a struggle organization. Malcolm saw it as a struggle organization. And remember the MMI, the Muslim Mosque Incorporated was created supposedly to correct some of the mistakes that he thought the nation had made, you know? Um, and so that was supposed to serve as a model for what in a, you know, black, you know, Islamic, militant organization should be about. It's just that Malcolm never really had a whole lot of time to, to develop the organization like he wanted and stuff. But yeah, that should have been a, a corrective because Elijah Muhammad frowned upon the nation being more political. And then the other thing is that they even bumped heads because Elijah Muhammad didn't, didn't like Malcolm to even debate members. Oh, wait a minute, I did something. Uh, okay, y'all still see me? Yeah, I see you. You're fine. Okay. For some reason, though, I can't see myself. Let me... Uh, okay, I mean, I can I can keep going, but... Yeah, I, we can see you. Okay, okay. Then, I guess the other thing is that um, Elijah Muhammad really didn't like Malcolm even debating uh, civil rights leaders because he viewed that as pushing them further into the civil rights camp. And he didn't, you know, Elijah Muhammad didn't want the nation to be part of that whole civil rights camp. And I think we forget that, um, you know, the conservatism of the nation of Islam, but they were a very conservative organization and Elijah Muhammad was happy for them just to be a conservative religious, you know, black religious organization, whereas Malcolm's vision was a lot more broader, you know, a lot more political than that. Yeah, those are good observations. And the film, Make It Plain, uh, there's an observation by one of his brothers where he says that um, Malcolm was beginning to sound more like the civil rights movement. And Brother mm -hmm. Joseph in the nation, who admitted at the end of his life, his real negative roles and going after Malcolm, uh, he said uh, he just stopped believing in what Malcolm was saying because he didn't sound like the Malcolm who was walking the straight religious line. And then Malcolm had observed that he was concerned that the nation was becoming isolated from the main currents of the Black Freedom Movement. In 1963, Malcolm called the meeting in San Francisco of the major freedom movement leaders. He sent out notices to 60 people, 15 of us showed up. And I just, well, I've been chair of core now for about six months. This was in the summer. It's not long before uh, the split. And I remember Malcolm came to the meeting in a seersucker suit, one of these cheap little uh, uh, striped suits. And the minister from the Nation of Islam in LA was with him. And this was around the time that the police had attacked the nation. And uh, I remember he's sitting, because he was in the Sun Reporter newspaper building. This is a black newspaper uh, for the Bay Area run by a black radical, uh, Carlton Goodlett, who was Paul Robeson's replacement when Robeson was denied a passport. So he's a radical himself. And Malcolm is sitting with his back to a wall, which was always the case with newspapers spread out. And so 15 of us come, my father was with me and my father remembered something I didn't. He said, when you saw Malcolm, there was a goose bump that would go up and down his neck. I didn't notice that, you know? So Malcolm was giving us 
the Nation of Islam line on things and quoting what was going on in the country. But this was a part of his attempt to do outreach with what he saw as the Young Turks, the young activists in the movement, because he was trying to, one, gauge the temperature, but also maintain contact. So when he finished with his discussion, I raised my hand because we're in the midst of major job campaigns. And I said, you know, you know, we appreciate the Nation of Islam and good work you're doing, but you know, we're out here fighting for jobs for black people. Muslims are, you know, wearing their suits and bow ties and walking in and getting the jobs, which we opened up for black people. We have a problem with that, but they're not doing anything to help us. What the holy hell's going on? And then Malcolm gave his line, and the line was before the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you know, um, the uh, system wouldn't be dealing with you. But because the system is so afraid of the nation of Islam, now they're willing to deal with you. And I said, uh uh, I said, the power structure is not afraid of the nation of Islam. I want an answer. Why isn't the nation doing something? And so Malcolm said, the nation would be announcing a political action program soon. Now I notice in your book where you make uh, a note of the fact that I didn't, I didn't remember that Malcolm has started a voter registration uh, campaign in March mm -hmm. 7, which was mild. And, and I think part of what he was saying was, because he liked Adam Clayton Powell, we can get into electoral politics. You know, we, we, we don't have to do any nonviolence and we're definitely not talking about integration, but we can take some part of this movement. So that's just a few months before he's put down. And so he's saying, his answer was, the messenger will be announcing a political action program soon. We didn't know what that meant until after he was forced out of the nation. So it suggested that he thought that maybe he might win this internal struggle in terms of getting the nation engaged. What do you think? Yeah, um, and I think the record actually, you know, bears that out. I think, you know, Malcolm was always hoping, because remember, keep this in mind, Malcolm could sometimes, not, not so much with the political thing, but he could convince Elijah Muhammad to do things sometimes that took Elijah out of his comfort zone. So I don't think it was unrealistic on Malcolm's part to think of the possibility that he can sway them. But here's the problem, though, that Malcolm is going to run into. Uh, 1963 was a difficult year in the relationship between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. And this is a year in which you see Elijah Muhammad becoming much more resistant to Malcolm's ideals. You know, there was a time, you know, in which, um, you know, if uh, Malcolm, you know, in his administrative duties, if he wanted to sit somebody down, you know, the minister at such and such isn't doing a good job, the quotas are down, you know, the, the uh, fishing is down, they're not getting the numbers and stuff, I want to replace him with such and such. But there was a time in 61 and 62 that all Malcolm had to do was just make the recommendation and Elijah Muhammad would, would basically just rubber stamp it. Well, in 63, this is when you begin to see that relationship changing and the rubber stamping uh, begins to get reduced more and more. And what I would suggest is that that was an indication of the deterioration of the relation, you know, in the relationship between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. And, and, and in fact, I, I isolate an incident one time in which um, they were uh, talking about the, the number of people Malcolm had spoke, uh, I wanna say it was in the Chicago mosque, but anyway, he had spoke. And normally Elijah Muhammad is, is always happy when whatever the numbers are, but he was never critical when the numbers were not all that great as far as people who, you know, after Malcolm spoke, joined, joined the nation. And I want to say this was probably around May, May 63. Um, they're having this conversation, Malcolm and uh, Elijah Muhammad, and Elijah asked him, well, how many people did you get last year? I mean, uh, last night. And Malcolm said, you know, we signed up 15 or something like that. 
And El- Elijah Muhammad basically, you know, cracked on him, said, well, that's not that's not good enough. Well, I view that as an indication of a much larger challenge that was going on in their relationship. You know, it was deteriorating. And I think once, you know, I think 63, and here's the thing, 63 at the same time was also the year that Malcolm really was pushing for a more political nation. You know, because they, I mean, there was, uh, you know, you know, a uh, voter registration. He wanted some uh, unity conferences between the nation and some of the civil rights leaders. It was like a lot of things that Malcolm was pushing and Elijah Muhammad began to resist, you know, and it's going to reach the point by the time you're in the fall of 1963, uh, for the most part, um, you know, very little love coming to Malcolm from Elijah Muhammad from an administrative standpoint and certainly from a uh, political standpoint. Your your book, you note that one of the clear indications of a real problem that Malcolm was having with the messenger was when he wanted to sit down Joseph in Mm -hmm. the Harlem uh, Temple number seven. Joseph being in charge of the fruit and um, hard head. And uh, always, yeah. you point out in your book, the fruit was separate in chain of command from the minister in charge of a mosque. So you point out that indicated a problem right there. It really did. And and if, 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 if I could just add something to it, what's really significant about the whole Joseph thing is that remember, Joseph was the regional captain um, on the East Coast. Mm. So, you know, so, you know, a title that Elijah Muhammad had, had ultimately given him, which meant that he had a, an even larger role to play than he had like the year before or so. And so there was always this power, this kind of underlying power struggle between Malcolm and Joseph, you know, because there was no love lost as, as we you know, all agree, no love lost between Malcolm and Joseph. And so this was kind of like a litmus test, you know, between who has the influence? Is it Malcolm or is it Joseph? Well, a year before, two years before, it would have easily have been Malcolm. But at this stage of the game, because of the deterioration of their relationship, um, you know, Elijah Muhammad went with uh, Joseph. And I think that the larger picture was that Elijah Muhammad was basically saying that he was pretty much, he was tying his hands with Malcolm. He was, he was tired of Malcolm. And then everything that happened after that was just icing on the cake. You know, the Kenny assassination and all those types of things, you know, was just basically, you know, just icing on the cake. The deterioration had already taken place. And then at that stage of the game, Elijah Muhammad was just looking for an excuse. Um, you quote in your book some, some thought on other thinkers who are talking about the conservative nature of the nation of Islam as it became more successful. And then what Malcolm represented within that. You want to go into that? Yeah, well, actually, I think um, Karanga gave a very good analysis uh-huh. of that. And, 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 and his general thesis was that there was a power struggle, you know, by the early 60s within the nation of Islam. And the radical wing was led by Malcolm and the conservative ring was basically led by Elijah Muhammad's family um, and the national leadership, which was Elijah Muhammad's family. <laughs> with the exception of John Ali. And that, so they're having this, 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 this power struggle. Malcolm leading the, the more uh, you know, radical wing, they want to make the nation more serious. They want the nation to be more active. They want the nation to be a force in our struggle. And they're using race. They want to put the emphasis on race. But then you got the conservative wing who have gotten fat and rich and wealthy. They all got Cadillacs. They all live in mansions. You know, they don't need, in other words, they got a good thing going on here. 
And the stuff that Malcolm is talking about would disrupt that. It would create problems. And all that money that they got coming in as family members and all that, you know, that would be problematic. And I think in the end, you got Elijah Muhammad was basically in the middle. Both the radical wing and the conservative wing are vying for Elijah Muhammad's attention. And he has to make a choice. And then I don't think it was a difficult choice, to be honest. But in the end, he chose the conservative wing. Uh, and that didn't leave Malcolm and some of the you know people that were kind of like under his orbit. That didn't leave them with you know uh, many avenues to go. You know, it was kind of like that was in many ways, that was also indicative that Malcolm technically had taken the nation as far as he could pretty much take it. Yeah, and what you're quoting there that Karinga talks about is the iron law of oligarchy, the more conservative, the more successful a group gets, too often the more conservative it gets. And the irony is that Malcolm took a nation that was broke to 75 million in assets and himself denied any kind of material comfort at all. And um, this, this would be the thing that would turn on him. But it, it kind of reminds you of what happens in nations as well. I mean, this is the same kind of politics that goes on, you know? It, it really is. Uh, uh, one other source that we want to add to this, C. Eric Lincoln, you know, published his book, The Black Muslims in America. He also noticed when he was writing that book, he too was noticing the struggle between the conservative wing of the nation and the radical wing. And he had some interesting observations about, you know, for, for the most part, whichever side Elijah Muhammad will ultimately go with will ultimately determine the future that the nation of Islam will follow. Um, you know, you discuss uh, the FBI and um, the attention they took and, you know, towards the nation of Islam. Could you describe like, first of all, what was the, the first thing that attracted or uh, got the notice of the FBI of Malcolm? And what was the FBI's general overall attitude towards the nation of Islam? Okay, well, what, what caught Malcolm's attention as far as the FBI is concerned is that in 1950, he wrote a letter. Um, and remember, they were looking at all of the mail um, that were leaving, you know, to and from prisons. Um, and in 1950, in, in this letter, he was writing to like a relative or somebody. He was making a point that um, he was hoping that the Japanese won World War II and that, uh, you know, and that he was a communist. So it was a communist statement that initially caught the FBI's attention. He said that he, he was a communist. Uh, and so from that point forward, the Bureau opened up an investigation of him. And so any, you know, you know, like one of the most interesting things that I found as I probe FBI files is that um, there was an organization in the Boston area an African organization called the Christmas Attucks Club. And they were supposed to be the, a black youth wing of the Communist Party USA or a, one of the you know, left wing white organizations. In 1950, I think it was 1951 or 1952, the FBI records show that they visited, you know, that someone there came and visited Mount and talked to Mount. And they made a note of it. Well, a few years later, when Malcolm is interviewed by the FBI, they ask him about that visit. Like they, they had the letter. So they, or they mentioned a letter and he, you know, said, yeah, you know, I, I, I remember writing a letter type of thing. But they asked him about the visit for the Christmas Athletics Club. And he says that he never, um, you know, had a visit from the Christmas Athletics Club. So that was one of the things that I've always been curious about, you know, because I, I, you know, it wasn't nothing that I broke my neck with, but it was always, so did Malcolm forget or did they, did somebody really come or was the Bureau just making it up? 
I was always curious about that, but Malcolm denied that that anybody for that organization ever visited him. But the FBI documents, you know, have the date and everything. Hmm. So anyway, it's just a little side order. It, it ain't no big deal. But I was always curious about that. So at any rate, they started investigating Malcolm. They opened up the file. And then once he got out of prison, they kind of escalated it. You know, they kept track. They kept track of Malcolm. And then what's significant is that they noticed something. As Malcolm began organizing and fishing, you know, for the nation, uh, you know, in Detroit, and then ultimately Las Bahamas is going to send him to other places and stuff. The Bureau began to take note of the fact that Malcolm had the ability to draw people toward him. So they acknowledged his charisma and they acknowledged his speaking skills and they acknowledged the way that he presented himself. And you can see in his FBI documents that they became much more concerned about mine. This is, and this is early on, you know, they became much more concerned about the threat that Malcolm posed because of his speaking skills, because of his articulation, because of, you know, his ability to draw people, you know, toward his personality, because that made him even more of a threat to the FBI. Um, in terms of the FBI's um, attitude towards the Nation of Islam, what was their general view of the nation and their approach to the nation? Right. Well, you know, it's interesting. Early on, what the um, what the FBI basically saw in the nation, if you look at the files and stuff, A, they viewed it as a black supremacist organization. B, they viewed it as a black organization that hated white people. So basically, they basically labeled the nation as, you know, as, as a hate group, as an anti-white hate group. So that was the initial draw to them. And so I guess in the eyes of the, of, of the FBI, they were an enemy because they were not one of those, you know, groups that loved white folks and stuff. But what's interesting is that the documents also indicate that they wasn't particularly taking the nation real seriously until the 50s. And of course, that's when Malcolm, in other words, you see a different approach to the nation of Islam once Malcolm got on the scene and they began to look at the numbers and start realizing, wow, this organization is growing. And they weren't rocket scientists. They didn't have to be rocket scientists to know that the reason that this organization now is beginning to grow is because of this guy, Malcolm, you know, Malcolm X Little, you know, as he was called sometimes, you know, in, in, in FBI uh, documents. Uh, and so they began to take notice, which meant that they started allocating more resources and keeping tabs on Malcolm. So by the time you get into say like 56 and 57, um, they were exerting much more manpower in investigating Malcolm than they had been previously because they've been, because they're looking at the box scores and they're seeing numbers. They're seeing that this organization is growing. And they've also, the other thing that they're keeping track of too is they're trying to keep a gauge on how our community views the nation of Islam, particularly when Malcolm was visiting and people speaking somewhere and all of that. Uh, they were keeping tabs on that. And, 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 you know, and, and, you know, as you would know, you know, people who have looked at the FBI files, you know that they would make special notes when, you know, because of Malcolm's charisma, because of how Malcolm was being respected, and the other thing that bothered them is that because of his relationship with Elijah Muhammad, you know, that was viewed as problematic too. Why? Because the enemy wants to create division between a Malcolm and an Elijah Muhammad. They don't want those two to have a strong, positive father-son type of relationship. They're trying to figure out ways to separate the two, to create tension 
between the two, which, by the way, they will ultimately do, you know, as you get into 63, um, you know, that's how they're going to be able to ultimately, you know, separate Malcolm from El Alabama. They're going to notice weaknesses and then they're going to later exploit those weaknesses in their relationship. Um, in, in laying the foundation for a number of things, Malcolm's relationship with Elijah Muhammad and um, removal, we'll come to that. Uh, you look at the overall approach of the intelligence agencies and particularly um, looking at how um, US intelligence agencies deal with enemies as a kind of a footprint to give you an idea of what was coming. What are some of those things, because you were looking at the international arena, what are some of those things that represent a footprint for how America approached enemies? Yeah, well, you know, it had different levels. So why don't we just start with the top? You know, the United States um, starting after, you know, the, CIA was created in 1947 with the National Security Act. And the within the first, let me see, by the second year in 1949 was the first evidence we had. No, but actually, technically, we could actually go back to, to 1943. 1943 was the first official sanctioned assassination by the United States. Um, and, and of course, that was during World War II. So it's kind of like a different um, fabric to it. But Yamamoto was, was a rear admiral for the Japanese you know, royal, royal fleet. And this was the guy who, he was, he, he was Harvard educated, but he planned Pearl Harbor. And he was considered to be the most prominent the most skilled uh, military commander in the Japanese, you know, Navy and, you know, Army as well, but he was in the Navy. So what happened was in uh, 1943, uh, the United States government intercepted, they had cracked the Japanese code without the Japanese knowing it. And so they had, they had intercepted a dispatch which said that Yamamoto was going to be visiting a Japanese fleet near the Solomon's Island. So they dispatched like 18 bombers. And they had one goal and one goal only to intercept Yamamoto's escort and kill him. And you know, this was signed off by, by Roosevelt, who's the president at the time, and the Secretary of, of, um, of Defense. So they signed off on anyway, make a long story short, Yamamoto was killed. So that was 1943. So he becomes the first official assassination that the United States participated in. Well, during the Cold War, after the CIA was created, they have a new vehicle in place. And that new vehicle in place is going to assassinate uh, by 1960. Uh, they would have assassinated somewhere about at least around 13 heads of states. Um, where people of color, you know, countries that are led by people of color. So assassination became kind of like the, the ultimate neutralization uh, method that the United States utilized. But there were, there were two other major ones outside of assassination that they also like to use. Imprisonment uh, was an important one. And then basically exiling somebody, you know, getting somebody removed, kicked out somewhere. Um, and so those were three of the majors that, that I talk about. But of course, that's looking at the much broader picture. What we need to be concerned about as well, and this also played out in Malcolm's case, was the various tactics that the enemy utilized. That is the intelligence community utilized when they went after political enemies, which is what Malcolm X was. And there, you know, we bring in, you know, what they call counterintelligence techniques 
and tactics, as well as counterintelligence operations. Now, people get confused by this, and let me kind of clear it up. When people talk about COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program, many of them, they think about the 1960s. And they particularly think about the, you know, the uh, Black Hate one that Hoover authorized that August 25th, 1967. Two years after Malcolm had been killed. But here's the, uh, two and a half years actually. But here's the thing, the tactics that were used in the 67 Quintel Pro that gets all the play were already being used by the FBI, technically going all the way back to the Garvey movie. And I think we forget that sometimes. So you don't have to, in other words, people say, well, they were doing all these things in 67, we know. But what about, but Malcolm was killed before that. So what were they doing against Malcolm? It was the same damn tactics that they were using. And in fact, look at it from the standpoint. The first official Quantel Pro was, was um, 1956. That was against the Communist Party USA. The next one was 1961, and that was the Socialist Workers Party. The one after that was 1964, and that was the, the uh, White Hate Klan Quantel Pro. The next one was the um, the Black Nationalist one that gets all the play, that was 67. And then the final one was 1968, and that was against the New Left. But the point that we want to be sensitive to is that the Bureau, every tactic that you saw them using in, in those other Quantel Pros, they were already using against organizations like the Nation of Islam. Along with the, the Klan and the Socialist Workers Party and the Communist Party and the so-called New Left. And of course, the Black Nationals. So let's get into uh, the Nation of Islam, uh, the uh, FBI's role in terms of uh, uh, the relationship of Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad and some of the role that they played in terms of trying to create or actually creating or e extending rifts that were already there or helping to create them. Right. Well. One of the things that we just want to keep in mind is that when the uh, FBI was um, doing their disruption program, and that's the term that they like to use instead of Cointel Pro, they will use the term disruption. But everything, like I said, that was in the Cointel Pro program was in the disruption program. What the FBI did is that they calculated by 62, 63. And what they determined was that there's only one way to create division within the ranks of the Nation of Islam. And that is you have to separate Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. Um, in fact, if I can, I want to uh, read something. Um, a very important document that I was I, uh, that I was able to uh, come across uh, when I was doing my research, because what they do in this particular document is the March 1963 document. It was the March 10th document, and what they're basically doing is the FBI is telling you how they're going to separate Malcolm from Elijah Muhammad. And let me kind of like set the stage for it. Um, this was in uh, 1963, and they had just had the Savior's Day uh, that year in Chicago. So Malcolm is in Chicago, and he stays a little bit, you know, extra to get some stuff done. Because remember, the Chicago mosque was was a mess, you know, and that was Elijah Muhammad, you know, in the backyard. And Malcolm's philosophy was that mosque should be the most organized, the most disciplined, the most, you know, the best running of all the mosques. 
And and so that created a problem right there because think about the message that that sent into Elijah Muhammad. You know, Malcolm thinking that, you know, this mosque should be better than everybody else, but it's not. So why is it? Well, because Elijah Muhammad apparently ain't doing something. So anyway, what's happening here is that the FBI is really watching the relationship between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad during this particular time. Because there was a lot of other events that had been happening that was creating tension between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad previously. So they are very sensitive to what's going on. So part of what's happening is there's a lot of tension between the family, Elijah Muhammad's family, which by the way, the name that that people gave the, you know, the uh, Elijah Muhammad's family was the royal family, which, by the way, a name that Malcolm actually created, the concept of the royal family, that is Elijah Muhammad's sons and daughters, Malcolm created that. And in fact, I remember interviewing Wilford, you know, Malcolm's oldest brother, and he was telling me, he was saying that, you know, that this, this royal family will ultimately you know, be Malcolm's major headache within the nation of Islam, and that they're going to ultimately, Elijah Muhammad will ultimately side with his children against Malcolm, you know, because that's that's the big power struggle that we're leading up to right now. But one of the points that Wilfred made to me was he said, you know, the concept of the royal family, you know, he said Malcolm created it. And then he said Malcolm created the monster that destroyed him. And I really had to, you know, you know, to appreciate what he was saying. Okay, so uh, let me just read this real quick, okay? Um, so what's happening here is that the SAC, that special agent in charge of the Chicago Bureau. And in fact, this is the same, this is the same punk that will help to orchestrate Fred Hampton's assassination uh, December uh, 1969. This is the same special agent in charge. His name is Marlon Johnson. So what they're doing right now is they're noticing that the longer that Malcolm stay in Chicago, the more the tension between Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. You know, uh, and so what Marlon Johnson is doing right now is he's assessing, is it to the Bureau's advantage to do anything or to let nature take its course? Or should they introduce some new disruptive things now that they know that Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm are starting to kind of separate a little bit, should they be doing something else? So this is what Marlon Johnson said. And when he says Chicago, he's talking about the Chicago FBI. So this is what he wrote to Hoover. March 1963, quote, at this point, Chicago does not recommend that any disruption tactics in the form of anonymous letters or phone calls be instituted. It is apparent Elijah Muhammad at this time is backing Malcolm and is giving him to some degree a free hand. It is also apparent Muhammad has no intentions of allowing Malcolm to get out of bounds. Chicago also feels that any anonymous letters or calls at this time could possibly identify the source of the information and could, instead of causing disruption, solidify the royal family and Malcolm. And he goes on to say, it is felt that Malcolm's presence in Chicago is the most adequate form of disruption possible as it is causing extreme discontent in the royal family and may well set off a chain reaction which could cause Malcolm to fall in disfavor with Muhammad. Now, this document was important for several reasons. Number one, the FBI is reminding you of the ongoing disruption campaign that they have within the nation. But they also mentioned two tactics that they have been using all along. The poison pen, they talk about the poison pen and anonymous letters. 
These were two of the most important tactics that the Bureau will use to help to set to um, later on to um, distance Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. And so the Bureau is talking very um, boldly and, and letting people know, and, and remember this is really just between the Chicago head, headquarters, you know, SAC and Hoover. But they're letting you know that the key to their program is to separate using all types of crooked things and tactics, counterintelligence techniques to separate Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad. That's what the game plan is. And by the end of 1963, they're gonna see the fruits of their labor. Now you make the point that one of the things that they let play out and also encourage was the conflicts within what Malcolm had defined as the royal family and the conflicts coming from them against Malcolm. You want to go into that a little bit? Yeah. Um, remember, the tension between Malcolm and the royal family is a natural tension. And the reason that I use the word a natural tension is because just look at the reality. The reality is, is that Elijah Muhammad is not going to be there forever. And somebody's going to have to take over. And going all the way back to the, you know, er, you know, to the late 50s, early 60s, it was thought that it would either be Malcolm or it would be a member of the royal family. In most cases, it would have, uh, Elijah Muhammad would have liked Ethel, his daughter who is also the supreme captain of the, you know, women's, you know, of the MGT, the women's, you know, uh, civilization uh, program. Um, she would have been his choice among his children if only she was a male. But because of the paternalism of the nation, 